We meet on this country in the spirit of reconciliation. As we come together today, we acknowledge the rich history of this land and offer recognition and respect for the custodians who have lived here continuously for many centuries. We acknowledge elders of the past who have created the history. Those who are with us in the present to lead us forward and the elders and leaders who will guide us in the future. For all embody the memories, traditions and cultures that are vital to preserving connections to this land. We acknowledge and offer greetings to First Nations people from everywhere in Australia. To those on country bounded by sea, to those from the red interior, to those who dwell amongst magnificent forests, and to the many who live in cities across this land. Central Queensland University Australia acknowledges the significance and strength of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island cultures and their place in the expression of an inclusive national society. Thank you for coming together today on Country. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ashley Clark, um, and I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land. I'm dialing in from Wurundjeri and Bunurong country today, and I'd like to pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. Um, and I'd also like to take a moment to invite each of you to write in the chat um, where in Australia or, or where in the world you're dialing in from today. So, I will be the moderator for today's session. Um, as I said, my name's Ashley. I'm one of the program managers for CQ University um, and I work in the Office of Social Innovation. But um, you're not here for me and you're not here to hear from me. You're obviously here to hear from our wonderful presenter today, Leslie Yulang Lo. And I'd like to um, invite Les just to introduce himself and tell us a little bit about um, where he's dialing in from, but also um, what, what has brought him here today with us today. So Leslie, I might hand over to you. So, good afternoon everybody, I hope you can hear me clearly. So my name is Leslie Yulang Lo and I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owner's land that we're being in from today and that is the Darablang people in beautiful Bundaberg. A little bit about myself, um, my mob's originally from the Bundjalung country, the Northern Rivers, that's great 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 grandmother's country. I was born down in the nation of the Eora people which is down in Sydney. Um, but travelled extensively around the country with my family at a very young age. Um, it was basically what our people did back then. So we were fruit pickers. Um, so during that time, I got a lot of, I suppose, cultural education in the southern country, down around Victoria and the Guri people, um, and then moved up into Queensland when I was younger. Uh, finished school up here, started a trade, and then basically travelled all around Australia doing different jobs. Um, I suppose one of the things I always wanted to do was go to university and I got that opportunity when I was about 40 but that came with a I suppose a long journey along the way so a bit about me and I'll hand back to um, Ashley now to continue on. Thanks Les. Um, so I will start with some of the formalities um, so just a bit of an agenda for today. Um, so Leslie will be taking us through um, a bit of a presentation about social innovation through an Indigenous lens but before we get into that um, I'd just like to kind of touch on a little bit about how this project and this presentation came about. Um, a little bit about social innovation at Sikh University and also um, let you know how we can obviously ask questions because this is supposed to be a bit of a participatory session um, so for those of you who have Slido or have used Slido in the past, um, you can either go to the website, so it's sli.do and just type in the hashtag ULANC. Um, otherwise you can just scan the QR code. I think most of us are used to scanning QR codes and it's pretty cool that you can do it from your screen as well. So um, any questions that you have throughout the session, please pop them in um, Slido. And um, yeah, we'll get to them either halfway through. Hopefully we can have a few points where we can ask questions also to give Leslie a bit of a break from presenting. Um, if we do have enough time at the end, we will open it up for a discussion and a conversation, um, but that will just be time dependent. 
So really important thing that we do want to know is that it doesn't reflect the voice of all Indigenous peoples, but it is informed by um, a lot of research, consultation with the Office of Indigenous Engagement and other Indigenous people. Um, when we talk about social innovation, um, we recognise that it's our approach to social innovation in terms of the Office of Social Innovation at CQ Uni. Um, and obviously today is really through the lens of Leslie. So when we talk about um, an Indigenous lens, we're talking about through the lens of Yulang. Um, and it is designed to provide a very baseline um, understanding of the complex social structures that are um, a hallmark of Indigenous society um, and Indigenous ways of knowing, being and doing. And so we really recognise that, you know, we can't um, go into deep complex systems in today's session, but um, we hope that, yeah, it's just an opportunity for you to, um, or for Leslie to, to shed some light on some really innovative um, practices and, and ways of being pre-invasion. So really quickly, just to um, talk about, you know, why are we doing this presentation and, you know, how does social innovation fit into CQU's agenda? Well, we've always prided, uh, prided ourselves on being a really engaged university. Um, we have a great guide to Indigenous the curriculum. We're really committed to social innovation. It, the UN SDGs are, are littered throughout our strategy. Um, and we're actually Australia's only Ashoka U changemaker campus which Ashoka U is actually how this project came about. Um, we, when we talk about social innovation without going into what is social innovation, you know, to kind of summarize, we really recognize that we are facing some complex challenges that are impacting people's lives and the environment. And if you break it down, we have four options. We can explore novel and new ways of doing things. We can improve what we're currently doing. We can change nothing or we can do harm. And social innovation sits in this intersection of exploring new and novel ways or improving what we're currently doing. And we really recognise that a social innovation mindset is an Indigenous mindset. 65,000 years, 65,000 years, the longest living civilization on the planet. You know, that's for that's not just for no reason. Um, I think that the things that I've come to learn through my research and my understanding and the yarns that I've had with Les and other Indigenous people, you know, Indigenous, we can learn so much from Indigenous ways of knowing, being and doing, and that we really need to start to recognise and celebrate and elevate Indigenous people as social innovators. So this project came about um, from a grant that was funded by um, the Pfizer Institute and, and Ashoka U. And Leslie actually came to me because we met about four years ago now when I was running a social innovation project in Gladstone. And I think that was the moment that he said, hang on, social innovation mindset is an Indigenous mindset. And we really, you know, kind of connected um, through that project. But Leslie contacted me about the end of, of 2019 not at 2029 yet, um, 2019, and, and asked me to apply for this grant with him. And so, Les, I might hand over to you to just talk a little bit about the project and, and where it came from and, you know, where we got to before, obviously, lockdown started to impede on it. <laughs> yeah, so as Ashley said, um, we met at the Social Innovation Studio in Gladstone, um, which was quite, that was a great journey, and it was like a, a very, I suppose, multicultural event. We had students from all over Australia attended. And that was when I first understood the um, framework that Ashley was teaching us was basically how our people had been teaching for 65,000 years. And that was a great connection. Um, we'd done other projects along the way and it sort of developed. And when I seen this working across differences, so we'd been to the Ashoka U Conference in Boston, America, um, I think the year before I attended, I was lucky to um, be granted a scholarship through the university for the work we'd been doing, which is the first time I'd ever left country, didn't have a passport, had to get a hold of that, but it was a great opportunity to get to a different country and talk to people and I suppose represent my nation internationally. Um, so that was one great outcome from it. Um, as we developed this Working Across Differences um, program, we looked at the way we'd look at it through an Indigenous lens. And at times, I suppose, Ashley struggled with the way I was trying to present it. And there was a combination of, I suppose, two cultures there coming together. And we both learnt from both. Um, Ashley provided the framework, 
I suppose I had my little novel way of looking at things that tested Ashley out sometimes, but she was able to work with that and um, develop it. So eventually we came together, something similar to what we're going to present today. Um, not quite. The workshops worked a little bit different. Um, and we went through, a, Ashley took on a fair bit of that role as far as um, moderating those workshops and, and, and looking through that social innovation lens at issues that affected the different places we were presenting. And um, the first one was in Brisbane. Uh, the second one was in Townsville. The, the cohorts from each one were totally different. Brisbane was more academics. We had people from the clergy there, priests, um, that were really interested in what we had to say. The second one was up in Townsville. In Townsville, we had a more a student base and we had a lot of Indigenous people there. A lot of people from country um, came to that presentation. And it was, a, I suppose, a bit of an eye-opener because the, the change is there. But as we worked through it, um, it was not only the appreciation we were getting from the mainstream students, it was some of the feedback we were getting from the aunties and the Indigenous students there that were going, we've never seen it put in this light before, um, we want to hear more about this. Um, and that was probably the best thing I got out of it, seeing that our people, um, confidence, their self-esteem was built by telling the truth, by looking at what our civilization was. Um, often I hear it called a culture and I'm like, well, a culture's one one definition, but you, when you look at a, a civilization that has religion, commerce, we have our ways of education, um, we have all those things that are the hallmarks of a civilization, mass agriculture. So we're able to uh, have our arts, have our festivals, it frees people's time up to explore those philosophies and um, enrich their society. So that's where we took it. We had some great outcomes. Um, part of that was, and I suppose it's it's a, the title picture um, that you first seen. And as Ashley and I finished the session at Townsville, we were pretty pumped. It was great outcomes. It was like really good feedback. And we said, well, let's go out and have dinner. And as I'm walking down the street, I see Nev. And Nev was sort of carrying a couple of parcels under each arm. And I'm like, Huey'd out to him. And I'm like, what do you got, brother? And he says, oh, I'm trying to, trying to get some money to get back to country. He's an APY man, so he had to get back out to the desert country. And he said, I'm trying to sell a couple of pictures, but he said, no one wants to buy them. And he opened this picture up, and I just finished talking about the Seven Sisters Dreaming, and there it was in front of me, drawn by Nev or painted by Nev. It had all those aspects that I knew of the story. And then on the outside of it, I looked again, and around it I seen this, this border. And Nev had actually painted the Bee Dreaming story first. No one was interested in buying it, so he painted over top of that the Seven Sisters story. And when I saw it, I just looked at Ash and said, oh, this has just got to be. This is no coincidence. Uh, this is connection. So I told Ash, you wait with Nev. I'm going down to get him some money, and I'm buying this bugger. So proudly hangs on my wall now. It's behind us today. Um, and that's one of those stories that is the hallmark of our education system. So. And we'll go into that, I think, a little bit more. You'll tell us a little bit more about the Seven Sisters story. But, um, yeah, we really want to acknowledge Nev. And you'll see him down the bottom right in the photo here, um, the artist that obviously we used the imagery today um, for the promotion of, of this workshop. So I just want to talk, and Leslie touched on it, yeah. um, just my experience through this process. And, you know, I, if I go back one slide, you can see what our project objectives are, you know, provide a safe space for questions and learning, increase awareness of Indigenous Australians as social innovators, deepen understanding of social innovation and shift epistemic views and create new paradigms. What does that even mean? I, um, I think, you know, throughout this process, it was a really, it was a really great challenge for me um, because I thought that I had a deep understanding of um, how to work with and, and how to respect and how to learn from Indigenous people. But I realised through this process that the way that I was actually approaching just the design of this workshop, you know, I had to decolonise myself, but I also had to decolonise the design. Um, often I hear people talk about this and I know that a lot for a lot of non-Indigenous people there's a wrestle there. What does this actually mean? And the next slide I, I kind of flicked to before um, Sand Talk, this book, if you haven't read it, please, please, please read it. How Indigenous Thinking Can Save the World. And Tyson Yunker Porter puts so many, um, you know, stories and, and, and ancient, you know, knowledge systems and ways of thinking in this book. 
And there's one passage that I just wanted to share before we get into um, Leslie's presentation that really stood out for me and I think it really captures, you know, my own experience, um, you know, working with Les and really kind of challenging myself to decolonize myself. So it says, explaining Aboriginal notions of time is an exercise in futility, as you can only describe it as non-linear in English. It's only describing the concept by saying what it's not, rather than what it is. We don't have a word for non-linear in our languages because nobody would consider travelling, thinking or talking in a straight line in the first place. The winding path is just how a path is, and therefore it needs no name. One man tried going in a straight line many thousands of years ago, and he was called a wumba, crazy. And he was punished by being thrown up in the sky. This is a very old story. One of many stories that tell us how we must travel and think in free ranging patterns, warning us against charging ahead in crazy ways. And I just love this because I think when we think about social innovation, when we think about systems thinking, when we think about actually creating change, transformative change that's going to have a positive impact on people and planet. We need to challenge ourselves to not think in linear ways, you know, not think in the ways that things have been done in the past, but consider free ranging, you know, thinking and patterns and thinking systems. And I think this is what, you know, for me, I really want to thank you, Leslie, before we get in. Me, I try to colonize myself. Um, but I also challenge all of you in the room with us today to think about when you're leading teams or holding spaces, what lens are you bringing um, in those moments? And um, we hope that today, you know, we can help you shift your perspective by a few degrees. And like Bruce Pascoe has said, the view might be a little bit different. So with that, I'm going to hand over to Leslie. Just a reminder that any questions, please enter them in Slido and we'll be, um, we'll be viewing them kind of at the end. So Les, over to you. So thanks Ash. So we're just going to go through our presentation and, and look at those different ways of being, knowing and doing and, and look at, I suppose, the civilization of our First Nations people. Um, do we meet all those hallmarks of a civilization? So as we walk through this I so say those presentation and our death by PowerPoint, um, we might reflect on that and um, see if we can change our view by a few degrees and have a look at our um, Indigenous Australian, our First Nations people through a different lens. So there's a pretty classic um, description of civilizations, and as we move through these slides, I think we'll sort of see that presented. Um, one of the first things a great civilization has to have is a great education system. Um, and our education system has been um, taught through what we know of 65,000 years of continuous history, um, passing down that knowledge. And passing down that knowledge through a system of, and this is how it's been explained to me, and it might seem to be in simple terms, I suppose, but to me, it can be quite complex when you start unpacking it. I've always been told to tell the story paint the story, sing and dance the story. Um, if you can do those things and put that story through those three lenses, um, you keep it complete and the same. The Seven Sisters, I suppose, epitomises that story. It's told throughout Australia, to the Torres Strait Islands, in different formats, but it forms part of that learning, not only the education system around how we're supposed to act in our society, in our communities, but also it starts to touch on that ethno-scientific knowledge. Um, the Seven Sisters of the Pallades system, um, as we know it through modern astronomy. Um, down here, that's we're, we're related to the Seven Sisters, or the um, Mirian is one word it's called in Aboriginal language. Um, it has many other words around the country, and the storylines change. But generally, it's around um, respect for women. Um, it's teaching our children to they have responsibilities in their society. And that's that first part of our pedagogy where our children, our women are in charge of their learning through early childhood. And that reaches right through to their early teens um, as they start moving through those circles of learning. I often refer to it as the seven circles of learning. You drop a pond into a pool of water and it resonates out. As it resonates out, that's our growth and our learning. And as we mature both in body and mind, 
So with the didactic learning system, um, with our teaching ways, the way that we present that, um, I suppose is really, it's sometimes seen as simple, but then when you start breaking it down, it becomes quite complex. And as you'll see in the next slide, we have um, two sets there. We have um, some APY women with their children out in the um, out in the desert country. And we also have um, a camp that we did not long back with um, a set of our children from Rosedale. Um, both paint-ups in this picture have constellations wrapped around them. You'll see the women from the APY land. That's a paint-up they've been using in their ceremonies and rituals for tens of thousands of years. Different constellation for that ritual. And the three girls on the, the right-hand side of that picture just came back from the Tarraburra land, which is out near Aramac, Bark Alden in Western Queensland. Um, that paint-up is actually the seven sisters on their foreheads and something we're going to do at their NADOC celebrations in weeks to come. So we took these children out to try and expose them to these traditional learning ways. Um, and out there we had a, a woman of, I suppose, international renown, now only Susan Thompson. So they have recently been handed back what was Gracevale Station, which has now been renamed Taraburra after the original people from that country. Um, and when we got out there, I suppose one of the things that just grabbed me straight away is Auntie Susan said, we are going to go to the Seven Sisters Dreaming Wall. And I just went, oh, I've come to the right place. Um, we went through that system of learning. Um, the growth from the children was just amazing to see that they took it on. Um, they were learning complex systems about constellations, navigation. Um, they were touching on plants and ecology. Uh, they went through the learnings about growing through their society and community, as told by Auntie Susan. And they did all those things. They actually, they were told the stories, they painted the stories, they sung and danced the stories. They went through the whole gambit of it. And not only, the, I suppose, as an adult, having a couple of uni university degrees now, looking at the world through different lenses, I was not only mesmerised by the way that Auntie still taught in that traditional format, how it impacted on the children and even on the teachers that were there. So the teachers were absolutely gobsmacked and they went, how do we take this style of learning back into our modern education system? And not so much how do we assimilate our people anymore, it was how we can learn from them and change our systems of being, knowing and doing and get the sort of impact in our school. Um, so I probably, the best way to um, epitomise that would be to listen to the interview that we'd done with the deputy principal now at Rosedale, Rosedale State High School. He was the principal, acting principal over last year. He came out on the camp with us and at one stage there, Josh was doing circles and he went, I've got nothing to do. The, the, he said, I've never seen this type of learning before and he said, I'm just gobsmacked. And I suppose this little interview will sort of relay the way he felt about it and what he got out of it. Okay, well, my name's Josh Morris. I'm the deputy at Rosedale State School. Uh, I've been lucky enough to come along on this trip this week and it has been an amazing experience for me personally. But the growth that I've seen in these kids over the past three, four days that we've been here has it's probably been the, the most growth in students I've seen in my career in education. They came, they were very timid, they were very quiet. Um, we were straight to bed the first night, everyone was tired. Up for sunrise the next day and that just brought the kids together. They sat up there for 20 minutes without saying a single word, just taking in the sights and sounds of what's around them on this country. Les, you're still on mute. <laughs> oh, hang on a minute. I might need to. Pete, if you can just press the button. There we go. Back again. Have we got me again, Ash? We've got you there. Thank you. Sweet. So I suppose we've touched on one part of the civilization of First Nations people. 
let's move into another part of that. Um, one of those things we must have to be a civilization to have to develop villages and communities. Um, when I read a lot of papers, I'm still dismayed where it talks about the simple nomadic hunters of Australia. Um, we were far from that. We had mass systems of agriculture. We had villages that housed thousands of people. Um, it was a dynamic and robust community, one that withstood three ice ages, um, major inundations. Um, as part of that learning the children were exposed to out of the Taraburra country, we actually found, well, the elders had found 150 million year old dinosaur footprints out there that had led up to the Dreaming Wall. Um, after we left, there was a, I think six universities converged on the place to start studying them, and not only studying those dino footprints of 150 million year old and one of the largest dinosaurs to ever roam the planet, but 55,000 year, 55, year old petroglyphs and a storyline that had gone right through up until 5,000 years. Um, in biblical terms, at 5,000 years, we had the great inundation, the great floods, um, and our people, I suppose, had a dynamic community and culture and a base that they were able to survive at. Their actual learning and knowledge survived those sorts of mass climatic changes. Um, so, you know, and to have those sorts of things, you need to have really, really sound communities that can handle that sort of impact. Some of the Cook's observations when he first came to Australia was that our people don't want our, want our help. They don't need it. They're happy with what they have. Um, they seem superfluous to anything we try and offer them, which I, I suppose lends to that whole idea that we thought we had it pretty well down pat, um, that our communities were harmonious. We had law, we had structure based around that to keep those communities sound and strong. So, and we lived in villages. So, and villages of thousands of people. So that's a great way to look at our people rather than those terms we hear about nomadic hunters and gatherers, which I think most papers that say that should be thrown in the garbage these days, but that's just my point of view. Um, when we look at our mass agricultural systems, um, so our grain belts, the last 65,000 years have been the same as that we, what we use in modern Australia. Um, as you can see by the, the diagram that's up on the slideshow now, we've got those inland grain belts. So basically our people out there were harvesters of grain, so the same as wheat production now, um, it's been replaced with uh, hybrid strains, but these are our kangaroo grasses. Our villages had silos that housed uh, tons of grain um, that perpetuated those communities. So we had mass grain storage that we could make our breads from um, that gave us those food storages to have strong and sound communities and spend that time um, with our communities, uh, the way our social structures ran, etc. On the coastal plains, um, we were more potato farmers. So the same in England and Ireland. Um, so most of our staple food source, our carbohydrates there, were of a potato variety. And as that slide shows, um, our women were out collecting yams. And it was one of these beautiful agricultural systems where not only we were like mass collecting these, but we were stimulating the environment, looking after the, after the ecosystems. And it was one of these base social structures that we had where our totemic system was related to our agricultural system. So people that were, had the yam totem were in charge of that resource and they had to look after it, they had to respect it. Um, they had to know how to contain it and have that continuity of supply. Um, if you mess that up, you no longer, you were taken, you were no longer given that totem, your family could be removed from it and someone else could be brought in to replace you as I suppose the overseer of that resource. A lot of the resources, when we look at the, um, the things like our, our fish resources, which is one of my family totems, the mangrove jack. So that goes into our aquaculture, um, the management of those um, major resources. With the fish totem, my family was in charge of looking after the mangrove jack. Um, so we had to know the systems, uh, the way they bred when they were mating, when we shouldn't touch the resource, and we had to police that. Um, to touch our resource um, was forbidden, so we could take you to task over that. But I remember when I was doing university, I had to do a, a diagrammatic re representation of an ecosystem, and like 
I wasn't very good at, I suppose, using computer systems. And I was sitting there one night staring blankly at the wall going, oh, how am I going to do this? I'm not great at this. And I was looking up the wall, and this is a picture that my little brother painted, Balan Bagara. So that's Aboriginal for Beach Boy. That's his name. He's the artist of the family. Um, so he'd given me this, this painting years ago. And it's not just a painting, it's the story of our totem and the story of how the, the fish actually breed and migrate out through the reef systems, travel out through the river systems, go out to the great spawning events. I sit there staring blankly at the wall and I looked at that and I went, this is exactly what they're asking for. So if I take a picture of this, and is that's exactly what I did, I took a picture of it and I put some labels around it just explaining that picture, that storyline. I think it was the first distinction I ever got at uni, so it was a great, I was like thrilled and I told my little brother about it, he was pretty wrapped about it, and I went, well there is a 65,000 year old learning system that I just got a distinction off in modern university by throwing a couple of labels on it and explaining the story. So it's that, tell the story, paint the story, sing and dance the story. So there's all sorts of ceremony wrapped around that. Um, one of the beautiful things about that, I suppose, managing our resource is that Generally, with the totems and the resource management style of our, our social systems, a lot of the time you are forbidden from actually um, eating that resource. So a lot of the kangaroo mobs that, that were in charge of running the kangaroo populations weren't allowed to eat that resource. But that sort of helped, I suppose, um, not having um, someone that was in charge of something so... Um, integral to our societies and, and, and the well-being of our people that you could and wrought that resource. Um, and also that you meant you had to work with all the other people that maintained other resources. So um, if you were supplying good kangaroo meat to your community, you were getting good yams off the yam people, you were getting good fish off the fish people. And there was this balance and this, I suppose, understanding on how we manage these systems for the benefit of all our people, all the community. So that social innovation mindset where it's not about the one person, it's always about the community and the benefit of all the people, not just one person making riches off their resource management, which is a, a great way to run a society. And it keeps us harmonious, it keeps us balanced, and it keeps those food sources rich and abundant. And uh, part of that system is in Australia, we have six seasons. We actually have a seventh season, but that's a sacred season and something I can't talk to, but generally it's six seasons. Um, and these are all managed by those mapping of the constellations. Constellations move into certain areas, but it's also this um, intricate biological understanding and ecosystem understanding. So generally the flower cycles, they don't always work to the month. They work to the climatic conditions as they change, flowering cycles and plants will change. Um, and we find that the resources such as um, that are interlinked, whether it be fish populations, they sort of react to these flowering cycles. And when we work to this dynamic system, we understand better the way the ecology, the ecosystems are working, um, if there's any imbalance there, what's going on, um, and how we manage those resources through this seasonal calendar, this constellation where it adapts to that, adapts to the flowering cycles and the breeding cycles of the animals, which are all interwined. As I learnt in environmental sciences doing at a university degree, it's a lot of the same learning I'd already known from an indigenous mindset from being taught these things out in country with the elders. So it's a brilliant way to learn um, and it epitomises, I suppose, how much knowledge our people had, how well balanced their societies were. And with those food sources, when we're talking like a really great dietary balance, Food is medicine. Um, the oldies always say that. I remember the aunties always telling me when I was little because I liked the sweet food. I was a bit of a sugar junkie, but they'd always used to go bitter in the mouth, sweet in the tummy, sweet in the mouth, bitter in the tummy. So sweet stuff's generally no good for your tummy, but that bitter foods are better for your tummy. And it was a very dynamic food system. Um, there are some facets of it that really start interlocking into the whole health and well-being of your body. Some food groups, they'll Younger children weren't allowed to eat, and it wasn't because we didn't want them eating it. The oldies wanted it all to themselves. It was in these cases, a lot of time those food groups contained elements. They contained different compounds that were no good for the growth of the children. Now, people knew this. Sometimes I sit there and ponder and just like, how did they know this stuff? How, how, how did they learn it? And 
and how was it passed on so well to our kids. So a very dynamic dietary system, healthy people with a great um, dental hygiene. I look at some of the aunties, like Auntie Susan out there when she smiles, she's got the biggest white teeth still. You still see that in a lot of our orders. Healthy, strong, large people. I think the average size of our people um, post 1788 was about six foot six to seven foot. Um, we see a lot of our big kids coming back now, those um, genetics coming back through now as they eat good food, um, they've got good health systems again, they're starting to get those big genes back. There's some really big kids, I had a few of the nephews come up the other day and I was looking at them going, holy smokes, well they've been feeding you. But anyhow, that's a great way to sort of look at, I suppose, the, the way our, our communities are coming back. And I suppose that pharmaceutical, that understanding of the pharmaceuticals was a hallmark of Aboriginal society. Um, when I've been studying a lot of the plants, how we make our drugs, our pharmaceuticals from them, a large amount of them are Australian native plants. Um, we have the oldest system of healthcare in the world. So um, one of the plants that I grow, um, that I, I study a lot, is a plant called Gumby Gumby. And in the picture you see up here on that slide, the women there are doing a smoking ceremony around their babies. That's a newborn baby being smoked. Um, we probably wouldn't say that's really good in the modern era, but um, even now we're learning that that system is smoking the baby with Gumby Gumby, which is um, in some parts of the country known as Mia Mia. It's a secret woman's plant. It's a sacred plant to them. They were the first women in the world to practice pre and postnatal care of their babies and themselves. Um, this ceremony not only protects the women and helps them heal, it protects the child. The plant has antibacterial, antiviral, antifungal. Um, some properties we still don't know. And our people understood this for 65,000 years. Some of the water therapies they used. Um, there you can see a picture of me with a massive big cut on my arm. It went down to the bone. I went and got it stitched, but then the next night I popped all the stitches out of it. And I went, oh, I don't really want to go back to the docks and get it stitched again. The nurses are going to be up me. So I went, oh, well, traditional mindset. I um, put uh, native bee honey into it that I've got many hives. It's one of the practices I love studying. It's a research project that I did in the early days of my university degree. Um, put a resin bandage over it like I was taught years ago when I was a little one. Uh, it healed in four days. I went back to the doctors and they were really wanting some of that honey. So they thought that was a, it was just, well, they thought generally it's two to three weeks for stitches. And they went, how the hell did that heal in a week? And I'm like, well, this is what I've done. Practiced some old medicine and it healed up quite good. It had no infection. Um, I didn't have any pain from it. So I went, well, you know, 65,000 years can't be wrong. So we've been practicing this medicinal style of stuff for ages. And I'll probably touch a little bit on how that um, invention, that innovation of our people has affected and, and resounded into modern, the modern world and has come to help us there. So I think we're going to take a bit of a break now, throw it back to Ash, who's the moderator, and let her fill you in on what's going on. Yeah, well, I think you probably deserve a bit of a, a, a drink of water and a five minute break. Um, thank you, Leslie, for everything that you've shared so far. And I can see that there are some questions coming through on Slido. So just a reminder, if you do have any questions, you can jump onto Slido. We are going to take a five minute break. I think, you know, a lot of us have Zoom fatigue. So please go and get a cup of tea. Um, come back at 3.45 if you're um, Australian Eastern Standard Time. If you're not, five minutes from now. Um, but yeah, if you would like to ask a question in Slido, please do. Or just you can go on and see the questions that have been asked and you can actually um, up like questions. So we'll ask the top top rated questions, I suppose. Um, so yeah, 3.45 um, if you're in Australian Eastern Standard Time or four minutes from now, if you're not, um, grab a cup and we'll see you back in a minute. <laughs> Nearly lost it. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to just mute us, Ash or Peter?
provide a response, but I think that's better off asked in Slido. Mm. Is, um, All right, so I'm gonna be a stickler for time. Um, we might just take you off mute, Les. Let's see how we can do that. Dan, if you can just get Leslie off mute. I have asked to unmute, try it again. Hmm. There we go. There we go. There I'm we go. back. Thank you. How good's a tech guy? <laughs> good to have tech guy. No, I'm not pushing well, buttons. Thanks, Dan. I appreciate you. <laughs> um, so, Les, I might just ask you, what would you like to do now? We've got a couple of questions. Would you like to respond to some of the questions or do you want to kind of keep going with the presentation and do the questions at the end? Uh, let's respond to a couple of questions. We've it up. All right, cool. Um, first questions for me, I'm going to come to that at the end. Um, I think this is a really interesting question. So um, is it possible to balance an Indigenous way of living, uh, eating, understanding of seasons, etc., with a metropolitan location and way of life? It's a great question. I feel like this is the wrestle that I... <laughs> it is. It's like often uh, I like going to the big cities because I like exposing myself to some of the culture and that down there, but it's it's so... Mm, and it's like it's great to come back even to a regional centre like Bundaberg, but even in Bundaberg I feel it's a little bit sometimes that I'd really like to get back to the bush. Um, but when I'm here, I try and 
practice uh, that way of eating. So I suppose it's not always about that that European way of eating where it's like th um, meat and free veg. It's like um, when you eat like you know, I've eat that protein or then you have your mass veggie hit or you have your mass green hits like your warrigal veggies and that sort of thing. Um, I think that's a lot balanced diet. Um, even in the city you can You've got to find those spaces and places that nature still touches um, to have that hit. I get up at sun up every morning. Um, I do morning prayers. People, our people have been doing that for 60,000 years. Um, I give thanks for the sun coming up, and that's how I start my day. I generally start it with some nice tea, some gumby tea, or something that's really good, and I'm fired up for the day. I go for it. So. It's that wrestle, I suppose, all the time. Um, I'm really looking forward to getting back to the bush myself in years to come. But um, I love what I do now as far as working with the university, working with the schools and the kids. And I get a lot of everything. I get a really nice balance in my life. So I think it's something you need to work on, find those spaces and places there that make you happy. And, and, and get out into nature because four walls around you all the time is just not good for your mental health. It's just not good for the body and spirit. Yeah, and I think it's uh, there's an interesting um, kind of uh, not question in that, but when they refer to um, the the six seasons, and you refer to the six seasons, um, what can you tell us about like how can we be more conscious of those six seasons and the types of food that we should be consuming in those seasons? Even are there are there places that we can kind of understand that better, or resources for people to be able to understand that better, so they they are eating seasonally. Yeah, so there is some really good resource around. There's a lot of Indigenous communities that are really starting to, I suppose, develop um, some of those seasonal calendars and, and not forgetting that, you know, the seasonal calendar of uh, the Guri people around Victoria is different from the seasonal calendar of um, Grandma's Country in New South Wales. It's different from the seasonal mm. calendar of Queensland. Um, you know, I travelled down to Batemans Bay where my son lives a lot. Um, and there's different plant groups down there, but I, I know those plant groups down there and I know their seasons. So it's great I'm able to pass that knowledge back on to him now and look at those different things. And as I think we're just going past, there's a, there's a plant down there that's one of the oldest living plants in the world that our people have used for medicines and foods for 100,000 years. And it's like, I, I don't really see it a lot up here, but I love getting down there and playing with it with him and making teas and and fermenting the fruit. Um, the calendars now, you can see a little bit on Bureau of Meteorology, there's a there's a section in that that talks to the, the seasonal calendars and the indigenous weather prediction ways. So that's a great resource. There's other stuff being developed. I know I'm working with a couple of schools in the Bundaberg area because of the, what had happened to our people in these areas, um, a lot of the knowledge has been, I suppose, lost in some ways, but something that's lost can be found again. It can be rebuilt. So it's been interesting to work with the kids around those seasonal calendars, looking at the plants that denote those changes. So generally the plants will have a, a two month cycle, a flowering fruiting cycle, and that's that two month variation in our cycle. So every two months, um, if we go back to the old ways, there's 13 lunar cycles in the, in the year. So if we break that down, there's two months, that gives us 12 and one sacred month. Thanks. Um, all right, so I might just, uh, just a few questions that we have um, just about the recording and accessing today's um, recording. So yes, there will be a recording and we'll share that to all participants that have registered to this session um, after probably next week, to be honest. Um, so if you would like to share the recording with your colleagues, we obviously would love the more people um, to watch this, the better. Um, a few thank yous for putting it on, Les. Um, just one more question before we keep going with the presentation, and please keep the questions coming through. We'll have a few moments to, to stop. Um, what is Gumby Gumby? Is it known by another name, and is it available anywhere? Okay, so Gumby Gumby's, it's one of those little commercial crops that's been um, developed, and I know you always touch on this, Ash, about assimilating our culture. I'd like to see more support for um, Indigenous companies and groups trying to, um, I suppose, grow their own own sources of medicine and the way they've done things before to um, stimulate um, their businesses, their economy. Um, there's some people that work with it. I'd probably be very careful where I buy it from. If you can buy it from Indigenous groups, Indigenous companies, good on you. Um, it is available sometimes on the net. 
Other names for Gumby Gumby, um, up north it's known as Mia Mia. Um, Latin, the scientific term for it is Pittosporum Augustifolium. Um, there are some stuff you see capsules sold online. I'm not too fussed on them. I, I've always been taught that it needs to be done in certain ways, so I'll follow the practices of 65,000 years before I'll take it in a capsule, uh, that's for sure. So a little bit of research online, try and buy from indigenous firms, organisations if you can, um, and maybe get out there and maybe stimulate some economic growth for our people. Yeah, and I think that that's a really important point when we are talking about Indigenous knowledge, Indigenous ways of knowing, being and doing, it's really important that we're not appropriating that knowledge and appropriating those practices. Um, it's actually about elevating First Nations people and, and kind of decentralising, you know, non-Indigenous non -Indigenous people um, to make sure that we we take a step back and we are learning, you know, and really learning with, with an openness and open heart and open mind. And also, obviously, like any um, indigenous business or social enterprise, you know, we really do have power with where we spend our money. So um, I think it's a really important thing to remember. So we might keep going because we do have a little bit more to get through and we can keep doing questions um, throughout. So Leslie, just tell me when you can see the slides and then we can kind of keep going and talk a little bit about law and regional gov governance. Okay, sweet. Yep, slides back up and everyone can hear me. So as I always say, like, yeah, you know, our society is holistic, so everything's inter intertwined, our law, our, our spiritualism, our religions, our agricultural management, uh, the way we teach. Um, when it's an holistic environment and it's all interwined like that, um, we don't have these systems like in the modern day when you have agricultures here, you have your environmentals here, you have your education system here, you have your legal system here. Um, what happens when something starts to go wrong in one of them? It goes wrong pear shape pretty quick because none of the other systems realise what's going on and all of a sudden that's really detrimentally affected the rest of the community and society. Um, I think when they're all interlocked, um, they all rely on each other. When something starts going wrong with one another, it resonates through them all and that's a great way to hold that social co cohesiveness together. Um, our marriage systems, um, I think is something that I, I really love researching and studying because our marriage system, our moiety systems, aren't just about who you're allowed to marry, they're wrapped around the very genetic lines of our people. So um, indigenous people have one of the most uh, diverse genetic makeups of any race in the world. And this is because of these moiety systems. Um, when we look at it, it's not only related through um, four to eight to 16 different groups of marriage interconnections. It's also um, through some of the, the research I've been looking at, it's, it's related to our blood groups. And I don't know if there's any nursing faculty out there or doctors, but when you start getting into that level and you, you talk about some of the issues that um, we have with modern pregnancies and that, um, because of the, the intermarriage sequence in our modern societies that didn't happen back in our day because of these moiety systems. Um, not forgetting that our law systems were diverse across the country, but um, when people say they're all different, I go, well, probably, yeah, they are a little bit different, but they're more alike than they are different. Um, so some places, um, a lot of the places I know, um, we follow our mother's line, that maternal mitochondrial DNA. Um, we can follow that line a hell of a lot longer than we can any other line. We know that through modern genetics. Um, I often ponder and think, well, how did our people know this 65,000 years ago if this is related around modern genetics and we've just started to understand about the female mitochondrial DNA that we follow our mother's line, not our father's line. Some, some mobs in Australia still followed their father's line. It was a, a, bit of a, a bit of a throw up, but generally the eastern seaboard, as far as I know, um, we follow our mother's lines and we take them, their name, not our father's, um, which is a lot different to the I suppose the Western ideologies around marriage and, and those systems. Um, the education, the environmental, we, we've touched on that, you know, but once again, how it all interlocks together and forms that holistic arrangement. Your totemic systems that talk about your resource management uh, related back to your family systems. So it's, it's a really dynamic and sophisticated system and it's not so simple to break down in, in a five or 10 minute yarn up, that's for sure. 
Um, but there's always great resources out there to look at it. And I think, like we said at the start, if you just shift your perception a bit and go, I think as academics, we're all taught to, when we're looking at something, when we're studying, when we're researching, going with a neutral, neutral mind about it, put um, your preconceived views to the side and have those truths based on the research and what you see. And I think that's an indigenous lens. So um, I suppose when our people come together, it's like we did this when we started um, setting up the workshops and this really done Ash's head in because she's like, Les, we need five minutes for this. We need 10 minutes for this. We need 15 minutes for this. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, I sort of get your sis, but can we, can we do this where we just have like a cup of tea and we get everybody into a room and we start yarning up and we sort of go through that process. And um, I think Ash struggled with that a bit. And when we first done it, she was like, oh, I get this now, because like by the time we'd gotten 15 or 20 minutes into it, um, everyone was talking, we were yarning up about what we'd do. And we'd already hit those first few things that Ash wanted to do in the time frames, but they were done in, I suppose, an indigenous mindset. Everyone was relaxed and just moved into the sessions really well. And um, I think the sessions were really well facilitated from that indigenous mindset, just coming together, having those yarn ups with our law systems, um, intricate and complicated. One of the things I see with them is that um, when our people came together, when the elders came together, um, whether at the Bora Council, the Tours, um, whatever description they are from the nations, it was really well done because our people weren't allowed to tear each other down. Um, if there was an issue or a problem with our social structures, our community, the people who come together, they'd have that time to get to know each other and, and they were already discussing the issues in a, a subliminal way. When they came together to counsel on it, it was, um, if you could come up with a, an idea or a way to like, address this issue, some way that we could move forward on it, uh, you didn't have 10 people trying to tear you down and tell you that you, were, you weren't right or, or make you look bad, that was taboo. Um, you had to come up with a better idea. You couldn't tear that person down. Like, I would come up with a better idea or shut your mouth was the basic ideology behind it. I think if we use that in Parliament House these days, uh, we wouldn't hear half the rubbish we hear going on there. It's like, if you haven't got a better idea, move on, hey? Um, so generally, if no one had a better idea, the idea that was proposed, set forward, that's the best one we've got, let's work with it. Let's go through that process. And it's that human-centered design process that we study at university now. You know, that inspiration, ideation, iteration, I've probably got that wrong and Ash will be going, <laughs> but we go around that circle, it's a dynamic learning process. Um, if we don't get it right, let's go around again until we get it right, get it set so our, our, our community is happy and harmonious. Um, when we look at the way our boundaries were set up, um, something I was looking at oh, years ago and I'm like really started to think how deadly were our people when they had this Rather than having geopolitical boundaries, we had geographical boundaries. And the mindset of that I, I see um, in the 2013 floods and the 11 floods in Bundaberg, how well our, our, geo, our geological boundaries, our geographical boundaries work. Because when we had the big floods and through the different watersheds, so um, a good example was Bundaberg and Gladstone. So as we go up the coast, um, the cutoff for Bundaberg and Gladstone is down a geopolitical line. It finishes, I think, just this side of Rosedale, but it's right in the middle of a watershed. So the people at Rosedale were in the Gladstone regional boundary, in the geopolitical boundary. Um, they would have been in a different geographical boundary if they had have kept the indigenous boundaries. Um, so they were cut off by the floods. Um, they could only go to Bundaberg. They couldn't access emergency services from who was supposed to be their region, their, their regional community, to help them. So they were basically tied in the area, which was using that traditional geographical displacement. So on the river systems, on the watersheds with mountains, um, and that's the way our countries were set up. So when it came to these climatic um, emergencies, uh, like massive floods, these sorts of things, our people were able to help each other out and remain connected. And I think that's a, a really good thing we should learn in the modern era and maybe start looking at those geopolitical boundaries rather than worrying about 50 votes or 100 votes up in that area, worry about how we help our people in uh, times of distress and in uh, emergencies such as floods and fires. So one of the beautiful things about using our astronomical knowledge is that the stars never change. Well, they do over millions of years, but not over hundreds of thousands of years. They're always there, they're always the same. Um, and we can use that those systems that have been around for 
so long to actually guide ourselves around the country. And they're like a, they're like a, a star chart map that you can lay on the earth. And you see the representation on the slides there. And basically even the stars at points, they look at areas where our people could stop. So we had those traditional pathways laid down and utilizing constellations to map our way through country. All our people could travel up those roads unaccosted. They could trade. They could go to different areas and be with family. Um, these were our, not only our trade routes, but our dreaming pathways, if you like, from an old point of view, or our modern highways, which are, when you look at a modern map of um, the Australian infrastructure system, it is overlaid over those traditional ways of travelling around country. And I, I see so many beautiful things when I look at it and study it. It's like even the stars mark points of reference where our mob could pull up. There were resources there to utilise. They could camp up there before they moved on their journey. That marked a water resource, a food resource. That was your little rest stop along that highway and you were allowed to stay there as long as you needed to before you journeyed on and you could never be accosted on those pathways. It was taboo to touch people so they were allowed to about, go about their businesses. So once again, a dynamic society, community, civilization, where we were able to have commerce and trade throughout the country. So much so those trade routes We've seen evidence now that um, one of our early pharmaceuticals, um, a plant called Pittori, um, was found in the uh, Mongol Emperor's tombs. It was dated about 30,000 years. That comes from Central Australia, the main source of that. Um, the complex nature of actually making the compound, if you don't do it right, it'll kill you. It is one of the most toxic plants in the world. As far as using it, it'll kill um, large beasts, like if cattle eat it, they'll drop dead. Um, so to actually make it up, you had to have a complex understanding of chemistry. Um, it is both, uh, I suppose, a pharmaceutical and a narcotic. It's got both both uses, but it's been found, you know, 10,000, 8,000 kilometres away, buried with a Mongol emperor, and dated around 30,000 years. So that trade route not only took it through Australia, it would have taken it up into the Macassans territory, it would have been traded by the top end people. Um, into Indonesia, up into Asia and into China, and it's found it's all the, all the way up to Mongolia. And it must have been highly prized by them to be in the team of Mongolian emperor. So how long have we been practicing this for? I've often talked to the kids and we try and, I suppose we've always got a cheeky nature about our people. I always say to them, like, we're either the first pharmaceutical company in the world or the first international drug dealers. I don't know which sometimes, but that's the way we look at things. And we've got to have a bit of a sense of humor because learning is laughter, I always say. If you're happy and you're learning, you'll learn it a, a lot quicker than you will. Our technology, well, it's, it's one thing I was, I was doing it first thing this morning. Um, I had to go and down and do a session at Harvey Bay with our kids. Um, and that was wrapped around boomerang technology. It's one of the things I studied in uh, my second degree is um, a Bachelor of Aviation Technology. Um, it was, People go, it's a funny degree to do after doing environmental sciences, Les, but um, it was sort of wrapped around, I was looking at the, the characteristics of bees and their flight patterns and how they worked. And um, I got interested and went and done a course in aviation just to look at that and then look at the way that we can design our airports away around the, the way bees design their hives and, and taking that complex nature of uh, bioengineering that our people have used for so many tens of thousands of years and applying that to what is the best for our people. Um, so my handy dandy assistant here. So uh, it's one of the things that you go at the kids and you go, what's this? And everyone goes, it's a boomerang. And I'll go, beauty spot on. And I'm like, but what else can it be called? And the kids sort of look at me blankly and I'm like, well, the first paper I ever wrote um, was about the, the advancement of aviation or the history of aviation in Australia. And I started with the first unmanned aerial vehicle ever designed was designed by uh, an, an Aboriginal people 40,000 years ago. And when I do this with the kids and I go, what's that? They go, oh, that's an airplane. And sometimes I have to make the sound and go and get them going. But anyhow, we get there eventually. Um, and it is, it is the first mono wing ever developed. It's got the basic characteristics. It flies, it returns, um, it's got ailerons. Um, I actually got called up to my head lecturer's office when I put that paper and he's like, please explain Leslie. So we went through it. Um, he actually travels all over the world. He's um, an ex-colonel with the United States Air Force, and a lot of his lectures he starts off with now. The first unmanned aerial vehicle ever invented in the world was 40,000 years ago by the ancient people of Australia. So that's a great outcome, I think, for a student studying at university. 
Um, one of the people that I talk about when I talk to the kids is one of, uh, how would you describe David Udipon? I, I suppose his old nickname is the best way to describe David Udipon. He's called the Black Leonardo da Vinci of Australia. And he's a gentleman on the back of our $50 note, first indigenous man or woman ever to be put on one of our currencies. And what David did with these, he was a master boomerang maker. Um, he put two of them together. And when we look at it like that, we look at, that's a prop. Um, he basically pinned them together back in 1700 and, oh, sorry, 1890, I think it was, and made them hover. So he basically developed and designed the first helicopter. Um, this is when modern aviation was just starting to be practiced or looked at around the world. Hargraves, the Wright brothers were still playing with box kites um, and they were failing miserably. David was down there at the same time Hargraves was working with the Wright brothers showing off these technologies. Um, and then all of a sudden there was inspiration, there was iteration, there was a process that the Wright brothers and Hargraves went through and in a very short manner of time some of the first planes were being designed and built and when I reflect on it, when I research it, I often think that the man that done that was David Junipon um, because he was a black fellow, he wasn't given any statutes for it. Um, it was not only just those sorts of technologies that he was designing through his indigenous knowledge, it was, if you look at the, uh, the $50 note, you'll see another thing there is the shears up there. So David developed a set of reciprocating shears. And when we talk about social innovation, um, how something benefits the whole community, it, well, it, it benefits the, the nation, all the people, not just one person. Um, so an invention is something someone can invent. He invented that. But what they did then was to go on and scale up the production of the manufacture of wool. So basically they were mechanical shears. The production was scaled up. It was often said that the wealth of Australia or modern Australia was made off the back of a sheep. So that man is responsible for scaling up that production and providing Australians with so much wealth and benefit. Um, when we look at how that's sort of, I often take this out because we fly our drones now. And when I'm talking with the kids, like we have all sorts of fun with these. Um, we go out and we teach them how to make boomerangs. And then often I'll say to them, that is a camera slung, un slung under form boomerangs. And that technology should be given to this man here, the Black Leonardo da Vinci of Australia. Um, a man with no formal education. Um, a brilliant man in his own right, but as always, uh, he was given no recognition. He died penniless um, and probably lonely. Um, but having said that, we start to recognise some of these beautiful inventions and how they have innovated and how those innovations have affected us all. So, next slide. <coughs> Pardon me. Dry throat. So, one of the, I suppose, the, the greatest social innovations I see from my people, um, just from my point of view, is the development of sport and recreation in our communities. Um, and we've been doing this for tens of thousands of years. So, we took war and conflict and we turned it into sport and recreation. And you can see this dynamic, I suppose, flow and innovation through our societies over 50,000 years when we look back. Um, there was a lot of conflict in our society, but the elders somehow understood this and they went, how do we change this dynamic with our young people, especially with our young people, because we know what young people are like. They're a little bit um, uh, short-fused, could I say, at some stages. And how do we take that energy? So the elders even started manipulating those conflicts and turning them into a more a ritual. And then that ritual developed into sports. Um, the sport games played by some of our ancestors were ooh, a little bit harder. I don't think they'd be accepted in the modern world because they'd come home bloodied and um, cut up sometimes. But they indeed developed the sport and recreation um, to continue this harmonious society. So when there was conflict, it could be taken out in the sports field. And you know what it's like in the modern era? There's a lot of papers being wrote, written now about the mental health that sports brings to our people, how dynamic it is for us. Um, and you think that our people were practicing this, they understood this way of the social cohesion 50,000 years ago and they started modifying their communities and developing these ways of having sport to, um, to lessen these conflicts. 
um, I think is one of the, the greatest innovations of our people and understanding that, that psyche of their people and being able to develop this. Um, the recreation side of it, well, we just had these massive festivals. It's like we had festivals that went for weeks and weeks where mobs would come from thousands of kilometres away, tens of thousands of people would gather and these were around, based around those big harvests again, things like the Bunya, the Bunya Mountains, um, the, the harvesting of the Bunya nuts because it was such a, a huge, huge resource and it could feed thousands of people. People would gather from as far away, uh, New South Wales, South Australia, tens of thousands of people would culminate in around the Toowoomba and the Bunya Mountains and they'd celebrate, they'd have dance ups, they'd have songs, they'd have sporting contests, um, things that we sort of look at, we say, oh, these are things that we have in the modern world now and that are only just been developed over the last couple of thousand years. Of years. Um, our people have been doing it for tens of thousands of years. Once again, marriage, law, all intertwined into these big festivals. Um, and they weren't only up in places like the Bunya Mountains, there were massive big fishing festivals along the coast. Once again, related to those mass migration of fish, those huge amounts of resources, and then taking all those food groups and being able to um, store them, to use them from different variations, whether they're making bread out of them, smoking them. Um, and then we had these massive supplies of food uh, that uh, benefited our communities where we had plenty of time to be socialising and doing the things that great communities and great civilizations can do with those resources. So I think I've talked enough, Ash. Oh, thank you so much, Leslie. You've been absolutely so generous and obviously there's so much to cover because there's so much. <laughs> um, but like we said before, if you would like to ask a question or if you'd like to um, kind of upvote a question, um, please do. We're almost out of time, so I'm going to start working through them. Um, I might actually just take us off screen sharing so we can see you in big screen. Um, so I'm just going to respond to this question because there's been a few people that have liked it. Um, how has the Sikh University presenter taken the Indigenous way of working into her everyday work with non-Indigenous people? Um, and I'm still learning. I think that's really the crux of it for me. Um, I have to constantly challenge myself and, and kind of my ways um, of doing things and my lens. And I think to be really honest, um, those who work in a university will know this, you know, these kind of really quite, um, you know, these structures that we work in, these systems that we work in, university systems can be quite rigid sometimes. So you do, you do forget often, you know, you are up against it and you kind of, you conform. So it's a constant battle of, of really challenging myself. Um, I think as a team, the team that I work in, we all challenge each other, but I, I would just say, it's about constantly rechecking in with, um, what lens am I coming at this with? And, you know, revisiting literature, I often will call Leslie, not going to lie, you know, it's been nine o'clock at night sometimes wrestling with if, with kind of certain, whatever it is, whether it's, you know, um, a conflict in terms of how I want to do something and how I feel like I have to do something. It's a wrestle. Um, so I don't really have a kind of, uh, you know, a neatly formed answer. I would just say that if it's something that you want to do, um, just, I think, open yourself up to learning and, and to connecting with Indigenous people. And like I said before, it's not about appropriating, it's about learning from and elevating, um, you know, our Indigenous brothers and sisters and really recognising um, the strength and, and the knowledge that's there. But I think as well, something that I've learned from Les as well, it's also about recognising that there's a lot of lost knowledge and there's a lot of loss as well. And so not every Indigenous pe person can stand up there like Leslie today and know all of the things, you know, about pre-invasion and, and the, the strength of this civilization. And so I think um, we need to check ourselves in those moments as well. Um, it's, you know, it's about being invited into a conversation and being really, um, really patient. And, you know, I don't know, uh, Les, did you want to touch on that particularly? Because I think that's something that you helped me realise is that, you know, and there was participants in the room with us as well who this was, this was new information to them and yet they're Indigenous. Yeah, and it's that, that loss of connection, that, that loss of our education system. But like we say, there's, you know, what's lost can be found again. Um, it's always great. You see how people, we, we're struggling so hard to regain it. Um, and I think it's a struggle that goes on. But when we have good people like Ash working with us, the universities and like promoting this, one of the great things I've seen, I was lucky enough, 
I got an al Social Alumnus of the Year Award for CQ University and when I was at the presentation for that, it's the first time I've heard the Vice Chancellor was up there um, after Welcome for Country. He called our people the civilization, First Nation civilization of Australia. Um, when I start hearing that rhetoric, um, it makes me feel better. Um, but it's that continuing movement forward um, that we move those untruths out of the way. We find the truth. That's what academics do. Um, we are a great civilization um, and we look to those parts that we've lost and what's lost can be found again. So we've just got to continue that pathway, continue to challenge ourselves. Um, there's a lot of stuff I just look at and I'll just shake my head and like, how did our people know that? How'd they do it? And I'm like, right, what have I learned from the ancestors? What can I learn? Just just change your lens around and, and all of a sudden the world opens up. It's a, just a brilliant way to look at the world. Yeah. Um, so another question is, you mentioned that the um, nomadic hunter-gatherer model used to describe Indigenous people was incorrect. Why do you think European historians depict Indigenous people this way? I think that's a bit of a loaded question. <laughs> yeah. well, we, we, we know, I suppose, that the simple answer to that is often history is written by the victor. Um, our people have been removed from country. Um, if you want to look at terra nullius, all that sort of doctrine through the ages, it's about um, I suppose if, if people saw us as we were, if they loved my culture and civilization, people as I do, they would never have given us that tag. This is some way I think um, that people go, oh, they're a simple hunter gatherer. Look at all we've done for the, the Aboriginal Australians. You know, if you start looking at that rhetoric and start believing it, you won't look to that, that great civilization. So, to me, it's like it's putting a handle on something that might be their own guilt, their own shame. It might be just a way to deflect. Um, who knows? It's like a we could spend hours and hours discussing that, and it'd be a great a great conversation around the fireplace. And like I said, when we we talk about this, we've got to be a little bit neutral about it. We've got to be accepting. Um, but yeah, I'd love to spend eight hours on that and a, and a bottle of red and and <laughs> see what we come up with. Yeah. I don't, I don't know if it's a question for you, Leslie, but maybe for some other people. <laughs> um, how do you manage the tension between Indigenous land management moving into the westernised large scale farming methods? This is really interesting. I think this is a conversation you had with a few of our academics in the first session that we ran. Yeah, so look, we know that modern agricultural systems are detrimental to not only the soil profile, to all those levels of like biomes in the soil. Um, basically now, since we've introduced modern agricultural practices, um, we've gone from say, just let's say, um, they'll get 100% yields 60 years ago, 80 years ago. Those yields are now down to about 60%. So these monocultures are detrimentally affecting the ecosystems. Um, we're basically poisoning and destroying them. And then we've got those flow on effects to like the Great Barrier Reef, just a knock on after knock on. Um, an organic system. There's a lot of research being done now. Um, there's, there's a group in Bundaberg that are actually going back to these dynamic organic um, processes of managing um, monocultural farms, not only moving away from that monoculture and having a more diverse system in there, um, using um, biocontrols rather than poisons. And because poisons, if it can poison the littlest animal on earth, it can poison us. There's that bioaccumulation. So that's, whew, that's huge. Um, we are an organic based life form. We're a carbon based life form. We should maintain those organic natures. Um, I think we can do it a lot better um, using some of those traditional knowledge practices. How we bring those two together um, in mutual respect will really define a pathway for but I think if we've been successful for 65,000 years, we need to stop and have a look at that and go, how do we bring that knowledge back in and how does it help us manage our ecosystems, our agriculture and our farming techniques now? I think that links back beautifully to the passage that I, I read out earlier about, you know, kind of dynamic patterns of thinking and actually thinking about things in systems rather than just kind of linear and driving forward like a crazy person, which many of us do, in, you know, and unfortunately, 
you know, the kind of capitalist nature of, of the world that we live in, um, you know, is a challenge. Um, I'm going to just open it up now because essentially we're, we are at the end. Um, we could keep asking questions, but I do know that, you know, people need to go and, and people are going to jump offline. Before we do, I would love to just um, ask you to take a moment to just scan this last QR code. I promise you it's not a very long survey um, and just give us some feedback on today's session. We really appreciate your feedback. Um, and for anyone who does want to stay on the line, um, you know, we'll probably have another five minutes. Um, I'm happy for, you know, people to just kind of pop up their hand and if you want to ask a question directly to Leslie or if you'd like to contribute anything, we particularly welcome any Indigenous people who are in the room with us today um, to kind of have their voice heard and, and have their say. But um, yeah, we really thank you for those of you who do jump off now. We thank you for, for joining us today. And really, Leslie, from the bottom of my heart, thank you for sharing your wisdom and your knowledge. Um, you know, and, and also just, you know, really letting me into to be a friend and a colleague and a collaborator with you because it's um it's an absolute pleasure.